your customer. The back. I invite you to sit towards a little bit towards the front. I think we may have a good conversation, but uh, I know it's closer to the snack table, so do what you're comfortable with. No worries at all. Uh, but thank you all so much, uh, especially to folks online, uh, folks here, uh, for your patience with us as we get this set up. Just to give a little bit of background, and before I do, um, as with any and all events that we host, whether with Muslim Space or anything else, we begin uh, in the name of God most gracious, most merciful, um, the most just, and most restorative, and uh, the most loving, and we invoke God's name in this space uh, as we open up. Um, so just to give a little bit of context, it's, it's uh, not really, um, you know, a, it's not really something that we have to uh, shed a lot of history on immediately, but like, hey, here's kind of why we're doing the event that we're doing, you probably turn on the news, you've probably seen kind of what's but I want to recognize that the event that is kind of coming about here, the conversation that we're having here, is actually one that's been happening for some time. Uh, we invited uh, Dr. Abia, Dr. Chris Abia, um, and she's been coming to the seminary for some time and being able to share uh, this uh, presentation, share these perspectives, lift up um, the voices of not just Palestinians, but also a perspective that oftentimes does not get the mainstream coverage that we usually will see. Um, and so, especially in times where we are now, it's even more imperative for us to take a look at uh, what, what is not being said. Um, but also, it's, it's important for us to reference where we see how this event came about um, and what, what, what kind of caused it. We can always say that it goes back to what happened on October 7th. A lot of times, especially more recent, that's kind of seen as it feels like history started on October 7th uh, because all the world is now watching. And by no means, especially when we look at this from a Masonic perspective, from a Muslim perspective, the taking of innocent life is prohibited, is, is, is not uh, permissible. Um, whether it's uh, even a tree, you know, you're not allowed to kill innocent civilians, non combatants, um, burn down forests or anything like that, cause any destruction or anything like that. So. Uh, this is by no means a, um, uh, a, a kind of supportive aspect of that. This is absolutely recognizing that um, these kinds of tragedies, this kind of tragedy did in fact happen. And this has no basis in the faith. However, it's also, we can hold that and we can say that this didn't occur in a vacuum. That people oftentimes will say this was Israel's 9 11. And we know what happened on 9 11. You know, innocent civilians. U.S. were killed. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not that, that, that that's kind of seen point. Like when we see what happened after 9 11 immediately, the rhetoric that was coming after 9 11 was they hate us because we're free. They don't like us because we are uh, free and democracy. They are this, we are that. And this rhetoric ended up fueling a war that took the lives of millions of people, displaced, you know, how many more millions, destabilized, who knows how much. But when we look at it now in hindsight, and we're like, wait a second, that didn't just happen because some people got on a plane and said, we want to go uh, attack the US. We look at what the activity was beforehand, that the US was involved in those areas, that the US had activity in that area, that the stated reasons for doing something as heinous as that was cited because of the destabilization that the US was causing, the wars that were being caused, the drone strikes that were being carried out, that one unhealthy way of behaving towards other people, one aggressive way, breeds a very toxic response in another sense, but it didn't just come out of nowhere. It didn't just you know, occur out of nothing. And when we look at October 7, uh, the UN Secretary General had signed this, that this was not in a vacuum. And unfortunately, had gotten a lot of, uh, had gotten a lot of flack for that statement as almost anti-Semitic. <coughs> that this was something that did not occur in a vacuum, but that was something that was for some people crossing the line, it's like, no, we have to stay in this moment, we have to stay fixated here. And what we want to recognize is history didn't begin on October 7th, but we can also, we don't have to lose sight of those who lost their lives, those who were killed, but also not to lose sight of what's the bigger picture. And as we'll kind of see through our respective presentations with uh, Reverend Crystal, with Dr. Chris, uh, to be able to kind of take a look at 
what's the deeper dimensions that kind of led to this moment and up to this time where the catastrophic effects are especially taking place within Gaza. Uh, within Gaza itself, you have over 8,500 uh, civilians that have been killed, most of them women and children. And you think that, I saw a statistic today that said every 10 minutes a child in Gaza is, is, is killed. Every 10 minutes. And I, we, I don't think we kind of get the, the, the gravity of it, the seriousness of it, um, until it becomes too late. And unfortunately, right now, this is kind of statistics that are destroying and ballooning and not with any kind of sight to, uh, to slowing down. Uh, the Israeli government has been very clear about no ceasefire, <laughs> where we're, we're kind of in our operation. And it's in moments like this where you'll see headline news that will be saying that, like, hey, this is the conflict, this is the war, this is the operation. And it's quite maybe not so much the case there. Um, we, we see the folks that get really um, you know, the, 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 the brunt of such a uh, impact are people that have nothing to do with the conflict. But also we see that there's a severe otherizing. Um, we saw after October 7th, a lot of this is barbaric, this is uh, inhumane, this is inhuman, subhuman, um, and this is what they do. And a lot of they kind of rhetoric. And so, we see that form in our own psyche. Post 9 11, it was like, oh, they, they, the jihadis, those people that want to do this, they're obviously very hate loving people. And it, it does a disservice to the actual humanity that is being lost. And so uh, the space that we hope to provide here is uh, restorative in that aspect of humanity. It's also a space to be able to lift up some maybe uncomfortable truths, but to be able to try to do our best to tell the truth um, and as a pathway to peace. I don't think you can have peace without actual truth. Peace built on lies is like a house built on very shaky foundations. Mm -hmm. And so we aim to tell the truth, but in a way that is not just to otherize with one side or whatnot, that who's right or wrong, but as a way of to be able to get to some place uh, to provide restorative peace. Um, as Martin Luther King had said, you know, peace is not the absence uh, of justice, that uh, peace is, is you know, justice full of presence. And so, Thank our speakers, and thank y'all, thank folks online for being here. But uh, I'd like to invite uh, Reverend Crystal to kind of open us up with some grounding uh, remarks uh, to kind of set the stage. And then, if there's any questions that you may have, whether you're here in the audience or folks that are online, if you're online, please drop it in the chat. Uh, and if you're here in person, um, I'll uh, create a system for you. Just write down your questions and you can have it there. Or when we get to the QA, you can hold your hand. So, thank y'all so much for being here. It really means a lot. We, of course, just uh, begin this fully intentional, just mindful of uh, what is kind of going on and what we take away from this event. Not that, hey, we just heard something goes out one year, but think of ourselves, what are we going to do uh, once we heard this? Thank you so much. Thank you to Muslim Space and Chaplain Sanam for always your chaplain in every space. Um, so you are uh, quite heroic to me, how you chaplain your whole life and the way you conduct yourself. I, I want to just read a, a quick poem uh, that I think is absolutely related to what we're doing uh, by uh, author and uh, poet, Aurora Morales, uh, Lemons Morales. Last night I dreamed of 10,000 grandmothers from 1,200 corners of the earth walked out into the gap, one breath deep, between the bullet and the flesh, between the bomb and the family. They told me we cannot wait for governments. They are, there are no peacekeepers boarding planes. There are no leaders who dare to say every life is precious. So it will have to be us. They said we will cup our hands around each heart. We will sing the earth song, the song of water, a song so beautiful that vengeance will turn into weeping. The mourners will embrace and grief will replace every impulse, impulse towards harm. 10,000 is not enough, they said. So we have sent this dream, like a flock of doves, into the sleep of the world. Wake up, put on your shoes. You who are reading or hearing this, I am bringing bandages and a bag of scented guavas from my trees. I think I remember the tune. Meet me at the corner. Let's go. I want to say that because is that truth 
is hard to find in every time and every place and in every generation. And I just have a few comments to ground us there in looking for the truth and speaking the truth. We are not feeling the weight of bombs physically here. We are seeing it, we are feeling it in our bodies because we grieve for people and we feel powerless. But there's another form of violence that happens all the time every day, and that's the silencing of Palestinian voices. And that happens in history books, it happens in classrooms, it happens in the news. So right now, I, who am an avid watcher of the news and consumer news can hardly watch the news because when I hear it, I am not hearing the truth. And I wanted to give you one example to ground you. How many of you are familiar with the killing and the murder of Shireen Abu Akhla? Okay, so that happened in May of last year. Um, she is famous Al Jazeera reporter, and she, uh, you can watch about a 37 minute documentary from Al Jazeera, you can get it on YouTube, um, and you can see a uh, live video on phone, there's um, anyone who, who wants to cast out on what had happened, which did happen, but there are also reports from New York Times that shows that the Israeli forces killed her indiscriminately with her press vest and helmet on. And she was reporting about an invasion into a refugee camp, Camp Janine. And her and other reporters were shot at when they got out of their van to go report. That you consider that when you're concerned. Remember her and remember her story. And remember everything that ensued and how long it took for verified sources to say, actually, no, this is really what happened. Because otherwise, this other sort of war, which is the war of trying to get the truth out, not a war of using arms, and guns, and weapons, but of using our words to speak the truth. Because it is scary because people will use other forms of weapons in response when you say the truth about what is happening. People will want to use other forms of weapons, but we have to speak the truth because we are in part here at this genocide and ethnic cleansing because the truth has been silenced over and over and over again. If the truth was known long ago, maybe we wouldn't be in this but the truth has been silenced for so long. And I saw an indigenous writer said yesterday, you know what, things aren't getting worse. I mean, you may or may not agree. Um, absolutely ethnic cleansing that we're seeing before our eyes is worse. But what she said is things are being uncovered. And things are being uncovered in ways that maybe they haven't been before about our nations, about our histories. And people take that personally. As opposed to saying, how do we undo this? How do we how do we repair so we can stop doing this? And so that's I think our invitation is the invitation to repair and to do the work of justice now. So that means speaking the truth. So when, when you think about when you're watching the news and its relationship to power decline, I, I ask you to please remember the story of Shirley Abuak. Look at her story and keep that in mind. And, and with that, you know, we're going to hear from me. This person's was standing there. I said, look at these posters. Do you know how old these posters are? They said, no. I said, these are 20 years old. 20 years old. I'm still using the same posters that we used 20 years ago. Anyway, my husband is uh, Palestinian. He's very against my coming here tonight. He's against my talking at all about Palestine. He says, it's hopeless, it's useless, it's no good. You've been talking for 35 years now, and look what's happened, nothing's changed. But I tell you, I have done several series at a church, and I belong to a very small group at church, we call it a life group, we meet once a week, and I share it with them, and they said to me, you know what, Chris? We look at the news differently now. And that's all I want. And so tonight, I'm not really going to talk very much. I'm going to let the video speak for itself. And um, 
I don't want you to accept anything I say or anything I show. I want you to go for the information. Because I think that's the way that people will be convinced. But just to show hands, how many of you feel you already pretty understand sort of what the root causes of the, of the issue are? Sort of? Okay. So we're going to watch a video. It's called The Stones Cry Out. It's the story of the Palestinian Christians. Of course, it's not just the story of the Palestinian Christians. It's the story of all the Palestinians. But remember, the Christian, these are people who've lived in the Holy Land for over 2,000 years. They are descendants of the people who walked and talked with Jesus. And personally, as a Christian, I feel some responsibility to them. And they are very much uh, dismayed that we, the Christians of the West, do not stand up for them. And again, when we talk about Palestinian Christians, we're not just talking about Palestinian Christians. We're talking about all Palestinians. So now you're going to hear the story of the very first uh, Palestinians um, when the state of Israel was established. Uh, just a tiny bit of background. You may remember that the first Zionist Congress was in the late 1800s, 1890. We're very focused on Gaza now. There's a ton of stuff happening in the West Bank. The same thing that I said. The settlers are coming down, rampaging, and they're burning all the orchards, never get to the city. And as a matter of fact, I had some battles that I was going to set up uh, with some of the news recently as you read them and write three marks and so on. Um, and maybe with some, I can share a document that I have that I put enough of a number of organizations where you can get more information. And I think it's really important to go to Israeli uh, sources of information. So, for example, one of them is the Salem. It is the largest human rights organization in Israel, and they waste no work, they mince no words whatsoever. They call it apartheid, they call it genocide, and they are very actively trying to, to educate their own community. Uh, what's the name of that again? Uh, it's Bitsala, B apostrophe T S E L E, Bitsala. There is just a ton of information. Uh, another uh, site is uh, IPAD, I P A. Uh, a I C A H D, Israeli Committee Against Home Demolition. And there you can find out the, I think it's hundreds, uh, I think over 100,000 homes have been demolished, uh, Palestinian homes are demolished. And they give you an update of the September how many homes were demolished, how many fields were burned, how many wells were confiscated, so on and so forth. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, the more, the better informed you are, the more it puts things into perspective, right? But I want to go back to the story. So part of the story was this possession. I'm sorry. So part of the story was dispossession, right? They were in a village. They were asked to leave. They were told maybe they could come back. They were never allowed to come back. And so the land was taken. But what was the other part of the story? Did they just leave? They resisted, right? There was a certain amount of resistance. Like, you know what? We're going to go back to our village, and we're going to do it no matter how, and we're going to stay in caves, and we're going to suffer, and we love the land, and we're going to go back to the land. So I think that's a really important point to remember as you look at what's happening in, um, in the West Bank and the resistance. Uh, and if you look at the history, Resistance has not always been violent. There have been many nonviolent resistance movements by the Palestinians, but you and I never hear about it because there are forces in our country, many forces, powerful forces, who are not at all interested in us hearing that side of the story. There's only one narrative that we're allowed to hear. So that means we have the obligation, I feel, to go and find the story. Why do we have an obligation as Americans? Anybody want to answer that difficult question? We have a similar, similar past. We do. We have a very similar, similar story. But what else about that? Yes. We're funding. We're funding the occupation. 
Uh, so the current administration is sending $100 million to the Palestinians in Gaza, and they're sending $3.8 billion, that's annually $3.8 billion, uh, mostly in military hardware to Israel. And now we're going to send, send them more military equipment. What is that military equipment going to do? It's going to kill more people, right? So I'm just putting this out there. I'm not telling you what to think or what to say or what to do. I'm just asking you to research it and come to your own conclusions. Go to these websites that nobody else goes to and, and take a look. Um, and I don't know, uh, do we want to watch the second video or is there there's probably not enough time now? Um, but maybe... We can, we can open it. Uh, Should we just skip it? We can hold on that one, yeah. Um, okay. There's a couple slides that were in there that I think we can we can show as well. Um, yeah, there's a couple slides, but um, no, you're good. I, yeah, you're good. I, I had a couple slides on here, so I'll pull it. Yeah, I'll pull it up. Maybe is there a way to share it with anybody? I'll email it to everybody. Go to to read a little bit more different perspectives.
it's kind of front and center right now um, in terms of, it's called Know Their Names. Um, and it gives a really uh, a good insight into not just the people who passed, but it gives a really comprehensive uh, dive into just the magnitude of the current operation in Gaza and the current effects of what's been going on. Uh, it's a real time uh, we're at like a page that they've kind of set up so you can kind of see what is kind of going on, but then also they, they do a really uh, unique kind of focus not just on how the conflict and how uh, the operations have been uh, affecting on a daily basis. But it also talks specifically about uh, the children in Gaza. Uh, and it talks about, uh, you know, just in the, the scope of what we are kind of looking at on a daily basis. For us, we may look at the news cycle once in the morning, maybe once in the afternoon, once at night, or, you know, maybe if you're like me and just refreshing your social media every, every so often, it might be a little bit more or so. But just thinking about how many people cease to exist in that space. killed in Palestine. Um, that, that, you know, doesn't necessarily register until we, we, we take a look at just the fact that it's not just these children, but uh, the report also shows the uh, scale of this on the level of families, um, the scale of this on the level of uh, whole kind of neighborhoods and societies. And so uh, I would highly encourage y'all to go, uh, if you get a chance, you just go to Al Jazeera, this is front page on what they published uh, to go through all the different people, but they've also shown all the families. Uh, and many of these families, if you, if you look at their histories, uh, these are a lot of families and a lot of people in Gaza are the people who were, uh, were supplanted in the 1948, uh, you know, kind of partition that, 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 that the Nakba, the catastrophe. Forced migration and expulsion. A lot of those people are in Gaza. They, that's where that's where they they, they 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 landed. But their families go back as as you know the uh, the gentleman that's in the, the video that that you know our we, we, this is our land. Our, our forefathers, our, our mothers have cultivated this land. I think that when we think about land, it's kind of hard for us to appreciate in our current context because, yeah, I can just move here, I got a job over here, all right, I'll just, I'm going to look at it based on rent, and that's kind of how uh, I will determine what's good land and what's not, it's the financial aspect, and I think we draw a really strong parallel to the Native Americans, the uh, first peoples uh, on this continent, and that connection of what does land mean um, to not just go on that land and say, let me just build something on it, but to till that land, to cultivate it, to have a sacredness with it. And why, why does it mean so much, you know, to uh, these people who are undergoing persecution? Why can't they just go find another land? Why can't they just go somewhere else? You know, it's it's so easy, like just escape persecution, just escape this, go find somewhere else. And I think we undermine the uh, that we have that cultural gap of that understanding. What does land mean? What does home mean? You know, in our context, home is very much uh, you know, transposable in different ways. But what does home and Land look like to folks that have been there for generations upon generations. Uh, there's a, um, uh, I know a, a group of our uh, students, we had a travel seminar uh, that went to the Holy Land. And one of the shops that's within uh, Jerusalem was, I believe, like eight centuries ago, like going back, the it was the same family. Uh, it was like tattoo artists, but like it was the same family that, that would continue to do that. And then I think you see those kinds of groups that, that are there. Um, but to be able to kind of appreciate as well uh, how deep that connection is, yet we have people in our time who are uh, contemporary who may not be that old, who were born in Jerusalem, who were born in Palestine, but they can't go back. Uh, so I think to be able to kind of see this as not just an ancient conflict or just a religious conflict, but to be able to see really strong parallels when we're talking about uh, the issues that we see uh, today in, in our, uh, our own society. So I, I strongly recommend for folks to uh, check that out uh, if you're able to, um, because it's just, it, it, it really does hit home. Um, and the uh, other thing I just wanted to lift up real quick uh, for our purposes here, uh, these links that uh, uh, Dr. Chris had shared, we'll send those out as well as the information um, that uh, was provided. So 
we'll definitely have that there. But I do want to take uh, time for uh, both Crystal and for Dr. Javier to field any kind of questions that we might have been getting. Um, if that's fine, could I ask y'all to come up here? I'm sorry, the, the mic just moved. I have to switch on the channel, um, but I'll see what I can do to it. But we got a few questions that came in from the online audience, and I know we've got some questions that might come up here, but I want to give y'all some time to be able to answer that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll amplify it. I'll pull up the chair for y'all. Will you be able to get those questions from the online? Yeah, I got them. Okay, yeah. great. Awesome. That's the one thing that's important. <laughs> 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 Right? 
And we're afraid to say those words. We're afraid to say apartheid. We're afraid to say uh, massacre. We're afraid to uh, say genocide. And um, we're going to be called out about it as being anti-Semitic. I say, if you are critical of the policies of the Saudi government, does that make you anti-Muslim? If you're critical of Indian policies, does that make you anti-Hindu? And so on and so forth. So we're not against Jews at all, but we are against policies which are inhumane. Yes. All right, do we have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Feel free to, um, y'all have a seat, y'all. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Wait. All right. Um, I'll, I'll read out the questions to audience and also for y'all. So the questions, so we've got a few questions that come in. Um, first one was, uh, was anyone at the time outside of Palestine, Israel, aware of what was happening? Did the UN ever comment on what was happening? I imagine this was during the partition, during the Nakba, specifically when there was mass displacement um, and, and expulsion. But uh, the question was, was anybody aware of what was happening? Did the UN ever comment on what was happening? <laughs> Well, um, I can't go ahead. No, go ahead. Go well, ahead. I think you know the Palestine was under the British mandate at the time, and the British were in full force in Palestine, and uh, the uh, there were uh, before the Israeli army, the, the people who became the Israeli army, army were actually part of gangs, or we would call them terrorist groups today, and the Irgun, the Haganah, and the Irgun, the Haganah, and Stern. Stern. Uh, and Stern. Stern. Uh, and they were bombing in uh, marketplaces to try to get uh, Palestinians to leave. And they were also attacking the British. So the British were very unhappy about this, and they actually bombed the uh, they, the um, they, uh, King David Hotel. What is it? The King at the King David uh, Hotel in Jerusalem, right? Where there were a number of British um, people. So the British were not for this. And you heard that at the UN vote they abstained. They did not. They did not vote yes. They abstained. Uh, so there were people who were a little bit uncomfortable, but there was so much lobbying and so much interest. And in, let's just get the Jews their homeland, and this is going to solve our problem, and it's going to solve their problem. And I know from Lebanon, the president at the university was a friend of Truman, and he was a Presbyterian uh, uh, Presbyterian missionary. And he said to Truman, this is a mistake. Do not do this. You will be sorry. But Truman was up for re-election, and he needed those votes, and so he went for the vote. So I don't know more than that as far Dr. as the United Nations. Dr. Chris? Yes. I did not realize that England abstained because in the Balfour Declaration, they're the ones who pledged right. to find a place for the exactly. Israelis to exactly. Yeah. That's what I heard in the video. They said abstain. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, that just surprised me because right. I thought right. they were the major right. force behind it. Since right. That was part of the British right. mandate. Spoils of war. Right. Right. The big powers were going to do right. with. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that document also was saying that they were going to do this in a way that didn't displace the okay. indigenous people. Yeah, okay. And they didn't have sort of resolution to that. They never. This, to this day, have never addressed the fact that they said they were going to, you know, be sure yeah. that the indigenous people were not displaced. And then, but also the settlements, a, a lot of things continue to violate yeah. international policy, right? Constantly, yeah. they're yeah. they're illegal. The settlements are illegal, and we also fund that, right? So we send three million annually, but we also fund settlements. There is a um, I guess we call it a line item. Uh, if you can find this, is public information. Um, people don't like talking about it, but it's public information is that we send money um, to help under the guise of, we call it um, immigration, right? Um, so we help fund that, and then people from here can go live. And it's not just live, it's displace. What you saw in that video is still happening. People are losing their homes um, to, to people who say, now I'm an Israeli citizen. So this is still happening, and we also fund that as a separate line item, then we, yeah, three billion that we get set. Thank you. Um, just to add to that, there was a, I shared this, um, uh, this link uh, in another setting, but I'll definitely share it with you all. This actually came from the floor of the UN General Assembly, 
uh, on the eve of partitions, vote, the vote for partition. And it was put forth by uh, Sir uh, Jodri Zephyr Lachan. Um, he was the uh, uh, he was minister from Pakistan um, and you know, kind of uh, representative in that sense at the, of the Muslim world, kind of. Um, but he gave a, an address that has been uh, copied down word for word that speaks, I think, to the context that had happened, but then also, I think, has a lot of imagery, has a lot of metaphor in it that's particularly relevant to theology, to the seminary study. I'll just read real quick um, the aspect of the land, the division of the land, uh, but then the implication of it. So he lifted up that there are, uh, at that time, um, one, uh, 1. 1.3 million Arabs in Palestine and 650,000 Jews with room wanted for more, and the problem has become insoluble. It is said, therefore, let us divide because it would be unjust and unfair that 33% of the population, which is the Jewish population of Palestine today, should occupy a minority status in a unitary state. Let us have a fair solution, the Arabs to have their state, the Jews to have theirs, the boundaries were drawn accordingly. The Arab state will be an Arab state in the sense that there will only be 10,000 Jews in it and almost 1 million Arabs. Very well. But what of the Jewish state? In the Jewish state, there will be 490,000 Jews and 435,000 Arabs. Have you solved the problem? Jews are not to live as a minority under the Arabs, but the Arabs are to live as a minority under the Jews. If one of these is not fair, then neither is the other. And if one is not a solution, then the other is not. Let us now consider the boundaries for a moment. How about the area? Jews constitute 33% of the population and Arabs 67%, but 60% of the area of Palestine is to go to the Jewish state. This is when they're dividing the state and saying it's a Jewish state, it's an Arab state, and then Jerusalem was proposed to be an international city under international UN kind of purview. Um, and so moreover, what is the character of the area? Excluding for the moment, uh, the desert waste to which I shall refer later, of the cult of, uh, co uh, cultivable land uh, and area for the Pal for, of Palestine. The plains, by and large, go to the Jewish state, and the hills go to the Arabs. There was a document circulated to members of the committees by the UK representative showing that the irrigated cultivable lands, 84% uh, of those would be in the Jewish state, 16% would be in the Arab state. And very fair division for one-third of the population to receive 84 percent, while two-thirds receive 16 percent. So he does, he goes into uh, this aspect where you can see at that time, and right now we're looking at it, you know, at the moment where things have been uh, shuffled around and have been distorted as they are, but this is at that time when this partition is, 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 is on the eve of happening. And he lifts up, I'll close on this, uh, this quote that he had mentioned um, in, in this aspect of what the effects will be on to Palestine. And he said that, how is Palestine then to be independent? What sort of independence should they have? What is the solution that we are invited to endorse and attempt to carry through? In effect, the proposal before the UN General Assembly says that we shall decide, we, the UN Assembly, not the people of Palestine, with no provision for self-determination, no provision for the consent of the governed, what type of independent uh, independence Palestine should have. We shall call Palestine independent and sovereign, but Palestine shall belong to us and shall be the apple of our many and indifferent direction looking eyes, but shall become the apple of discord between the East and the West, lest perchance the unity which our name so wistfully proclaims may have a chance to establish itself. We shall first cut the body of Palestine into three parts of a Jewish state and three parts of an Arab state. We shall then have the Jaffa enclave and Palestine's heart, Jerusalem. It shall forever be an international city. That is the beginning of the shape Palestine is going to have. And having cut up Palestine in that manner, we shall then put its bleeding body up on a cross forever. This is going. This is not going to be temporary. This is going to be permanent. Palestine shall never belong to its people. It shall always be stretched out upon the cross. What authority does the United, the United Nations have to do this? What legal authority, judicial authority, has it to do this to make an independent state forever subject to this? So, just thinking about the imagery that's there, but also how that relates, not just in terms of what's happening, but uh, how it pertains now to also Christology. Uh, this is this aspect of uh, studying what, what is kind of happening uh, in, in theological terms. Uh, the next question that we've got 
is it's my understanding that before 1948, indigenous Jews also lived peacefully with Muslims and Christians. Um, so where, whence came Zionism into, into this, if there are already Jews that were living there, what, how did that come out of that? Anyway, I'm well, just you to to who was, who's the name of the person that you were, that yeah, um, so the, the person's name was uh, Zafrullah Khan, um, Shogir Zafrullah Khan, I'll write his name up, it's a long name, uh, but I'll put the name up and I'll also send it out uh, with that link to that speech. I mean, I think we have to acknowledge too that for so long, and I'm sure you all know this, that Jews have had pogroms against them long before the Holocaust, and especially in Russia, and Christians going back to the 16th century, you know, maybe the 15th, started envisioning that they, they were transitioning from persecuting Jews to saying maybe we need to support them, but because it might usher in the second coming of Jesus. So you have that traditional strain, and that ends up merging with uh, Herzl, who was a Jewish man who wanted to have a home for the Jews. And there are people who claim that he was a secular Jew or that Zionism comes from secular Judaism. And so I would just say that there were people who said that there was a concern um, for the safety of Jews. And as you mentioned, there were a lot of places that people looked and there were Jews and Muslims, Christians living together just fine, Arab, Christians, Muslims, and Jews. But then when you have people coming from all over the world, not just to be as immigrants, but to displace a people. Um, and there is historical documentation that later people who got involved, like Ben Gurion, um, the first prime minister, that, that said that there's documentation that shows that there was intentional plans to displace the people. Now, if everyone knew this at the time, no, because there were philosophers who were Jewish who initially were on board, okay, a Jewish state. But when they went and saw what was happening, they said, we don't want any part of this, like Martin Luther. So, um, you know, in theory, people who were saying, is this going to be a place where Jews can be safe? And then when they saw what was happening, they said, this is not a place for Jews to be safe. This is a place where people are being displaced, as you saw in the video. And that's nonstop been happening. So, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Yeah, I mean, at the time, in the late 1800s, Palestine was 93% Palestinian. And there were about 7% who were Jewish. They were primarily religious Jews. And peacefully would be uh, Palestinian. Uh, my husband's family had Jewish neighbors. Uh, and uh, they... <laughs> Father time he said, okay, we're going to go to Lebanon for a while and then we'll be back. And the grandmother said, listen, you take everything with you. You are never coming back again. And he said, oh, no, no, we'll be back. We'll just take the family. We'll go to Lebanon where we always vacation. We'll take our things with us and I'll be back. And she was absolutely right. They were never able to come back. So they lost the land. They lost their bank accounts. They lost everything. I don't know what you can say about the key, the yeah. symbol of the key. Can you share with them? Like, I, I can't draw. So I would draw a key, but I mean, the sim that's why there's a symbol of the key. If you go to the Holy Land and you see the key in Palestine, it's a symbol of the people who were not able to return and have been longing for that, which is also a violation of international law because those, those people were supposed to be able to go, are supposed to be able to go back to their homes. So you'll see that key everywhere. Yeah, there's a whole group that's right of return to uh, enable Palestinians to come back or at the very least become a citizen. There it is. Oh, right. right. Yeah, I would never be able to draw that. Or not even an approximation. I'm not a person to do The other question we had at the end was, uh, is there any other proposal but uh, other than separate but is there any premise that colonial imperial legacy is non negotiable? That's good. Sorry. 
I mean, I, I, from my understanding, I would say I would quote Mitri Rocha when I saw him speak um, in Palestine in 2018. And he said, before we fought for a two state solution, and then I, I have a tendency to want to draw, even though I'm not a driver, then he said, but how do you do a two state solution? Which he said, so many Palestinians were in favor of. He said, when you look like Sweden. So then the map just keeps shrinking and shrinking. So if Palestinians are being told two state solution, two state solution, and they're saying, okay, but our, we're becoming Swiss cheese. And so we're not even, can be unified as, as a state, right? We're being separated into these little pieces. And so he used the analogy of Swiss cheese. And so um, I would say that I, I think you have to listen to Palestinian voices and I don't know what you, you know, you have to, you know, contribute because I don't know what you do now that it is Swiss cheese. And even if Palestinians are saying, okay, we'll do this with you, how how do you do that? Yeah, I mean the the Palestinians let me say are separating into bunch of stuff like it was in South Africa. And in the American West. Pardon? And in the American West. And in the American West sure. And so they are isolated from one another. There is an attempt to isolate them even more. And um, the idea originally was that the West Bank maybe would be a Palestinian state, but now you have 750,000 Jewish settlers on Palestinian land in the West Bank. And so that means getting rid of all those settlers. And it doesn't seem very realistic because they are quite vehement that that is their land and they are going to stay on that land. So the only solution seems to have to be that everybody's got to live together. Imagine that, right? But I don't know how you make that work because especially in the Israeli government right now, it's very right wing and um, they are not at all interested in acquiescing to any Palestinian demands. So, and I don't see our own country changing its policy, especially with this current administration. So I really don't know what the solution is. I think I, I would be very curious to know whether Israel is pushing people down to the southern part of, of Gaza because they want to take that land or they want to create a huge barrier between the Palestinians and them. And some people thought maybe Gaza was supposed to be the next Palestinian state, but I, I don't see that happening either. So what is it? What is the answer? There's only one answer. They've all got to live together. Right. Uh, we have to lobby for that. The Jewish community has to come around and say, okay, we're on board with this idea. And and, and Palestinian voices have been saying stop occupation, right? So stop the settlements, checkpoint, they like, live equally. And there is a population that is not equal. So until there are full rights, equal rights for everybody, you're going to see what we're seeing. There's a lot of violence in the West Bank that never gets reported. These many soldiers come in the middle of the night, they kidnap children, they take them down to the police station, they lock them up, they have no due, uh, no, no recourse legally, they're forced to sign uh, documents that they don't understand in Hebrew. Uh, the parents don't get to see the children. I think there are 9,000 children in Palestinian jails now. I forgot. It's a huge number. And maybe that's all Palestinian uh, prisoners. Uh, but there's a large number. Israel is the only country in the world that imprisons children. Um, that's one form of violence. The other form of violence is they're demolishing homes. The third part, third kind of violence is the settlers come in and the Israeli armies do not stop them. They often come in and take over house even with the Palestinians living in it and say, this is our house, get out and uh, force the Palestinians out. Or they just live in the house with the Palestinians because the Palestinians are not leaving their own homes. But anyway, there's a lot of violence. Uh, children walking to school are attacked by settlers. Um, I mean, 500 checkpoints in the West Bank, you can hardly get from one point to the other without spending all day at these checkpoints. People trying to get to medical attention women delivering their babies at checkpoints because they're not allowed to go through their, uh, to the hospitals. There's just enormous violence that you and I never see and that, that never gets reported. So why would anybody want to live in those kind of conditions, right? Why wouldn't you have a resistance? Why does that stop? I think this is, yeah, since it was involved in that, the point brought up a little bit, I can't just do a two-state solution now. 
I think if you look at how Gaza is not just you know, in terms of like, open air prison, but where the West Bank is, like, these are very intentional in terms of how uh, you have like you know this complaint that hey uh, we want to get Hamas out, we want to we want to do this in a terrorist organization exists, um, but seeing the roots of how did Hamas come back. Um, again, it's it's a it's a messy, it's a it's an uncomfortable issue. It's similar when we think about when we go back to that analogy about the nine eleven. Um, when we think about that, oh, uh, you know, the U.S. funding Mujahideen to fight the Soviets in, in Afghanistan um, until later we see, you know, in the eighties and, and whatnot, these pictures coming out and we see the documents come out. It's like, oh, perhaps that uncomfortable truth that this group that is causing terror that is doing this. Did not just kind of come up in uh, in a vacuum. It, it came out. It came out of a product of uh, very poor uh, you know, foreign policy in, in different courses in different ways. Um, and they think about the same situation with the history of us. You have a contention with the Palestinian Liberation Organization, PLO, Yasser Arafat's kind of secular uh, uh, party, um, and Hamas being supported by Israel initially to uh, basically. You know, kind of uh, divide and conquer. So, thinking about that, these state factors are always involved in the way they see the way for different things. Sometimes they're, they are as diametrically opposed as they feel. Sometimes they are um, on a uniform plane you know, for, for certain certain things. I think the map that we showed there is a two space solution here because it's because you have two completely different areas, but also. Um, the parties that are representing, you know, the governments, quote unquote, governments that are serving them different. They have different objectives. One is generally resistance based, the other is a little bit more combated in different ways. And so, uh, this is kind of textbook divide and conquer analysis. Like, well, they can't have two state solution, they have one two state solution. It's kind of like, look at this, you can't look at it as we start in the deeper sense. Um, we'll take just a couple more questions uh, that come up. Uh, thank you so much for your around, uh, but I think this kind of pertains to where we are here. Um, personal to that, that I have two pastor friends um, who both independently told me that when they went to the Holy Land, they learned the reality of this history and saw the plight of Palestinians, both Christian and Muslim, and that their eyes were open. Can someone ask, I'm still asking, I'm asking um, why is it that this information isn't more widely known by American evangelical and even non evangelical it didn't specify that for you, Crystal, so I'm not going to say it because you're a pastor, you can answer this. But what was the question? Okay. So I think there's a lot of reasons, but I think uh, so many reasons. One could write a book on just a few. But I would say, number one, why is the US involved? Is a response. Does it okay? So I, I'm not going to say any personal judgments about Joe Biden as a person. We can talk later. But if we, right, what he's doing is he's part of an empire, and that's not just biblical language, right? He's part of an empire. An empire doesn't act unless it has a benefit for itself. So if someone were to say Joe Biden cares about Israeli lives, I'm like, really? I'm not sure. I'm not sure an empire cares about anybody's life unless it's to its benefit. Right. And so empire acts when it's there's something beneficial to itself. So one time a politician who I'll remain unnamed was a Democrat, incidentally, was asked, Will you, uh, if you're president, will you ever go for a humanitarian mission? And they said, No. And they said what every politician would have said to that they don't act out of care, they act out of interest. So this reason that we don't know the truth is because the Palestinians are not in the interests of the US and other countries. If you look at the countries that have voted against a ceasefire, I would suggest that you ask yourself, and maybe we don't know the answer, maybe there are multiple answers. Why do they vote no unless there's something that is beneficial to them as empire? So we can't talk about it because the U.S. has a relationship with the government there, with the nation, state of Israel, because it benefits this, this uh, country, this country's interests. And then what bolsters that is 
Christians here in the country and around the globe who believe that supporting the state of Israel is the same as supporting biblical Israel. They equate them, which is, I would suggest to you, wrong and ask your Bible people as well. But if you equate the two, it has consequences. Palestinian lives are showing us that all the deaths. So then there is this support for this. And if you take Christians who support Israel in their minds, this is a, some biblical narrative, and you show them something different, it causes them to question a lot of things they've been taught. And so that that is also challenging. And then there's the piece about anti-Semitism, which you repeat. And I think you said so well, if we criticize the government, does that mean we're criticizing? You know, for example, India is going right now very Hindu uh, nationalist in its schools and things. Modi wants to really make a militant Hinduism that the religion of the state. And there are a lot of Indian writers who are attesting to that. So something to pay attention to. Um, are we criticizing Hinduism or are we criticizing something else? So the other fear is, is, is that People are equating criticism of the state of Israel with anti-Semitism, so then people don't want to talk about it. And uh, that's happening more now. People are digging into those. So that's why Jewish Voices for Peace and New Name Bethlehem, if not now, are important Jewish voices, Judith Butler, to pay attention to. And to say, what are Jewish voices saying? They're not the only Jewish voices, but these are Jewish voices who are saying, what is anti-Semitism? Hating a Jew for being a Jew? And to say, especially as Christians who have a history of anti-Semitism, we will stand against anti-Semitism. But we do not permit the displacement and the killing and the oppression of anyone. Why would we do that? And so you have so many reasons, but those are, I think, the ones that come to my mind. And I wouldn't trust an America's interests anywhere as being authentic, unless it serves. And then we say that. That's not in our interest. That's not in our interest. So they tell on themselves just fine. Yeah, on this point, I um, it's really important. I mean, so I'm going to my benefit or other going to be the obvious benefit to the U.S. I can find the billions, 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 maybe billions, billions probably from the weapons and defense industry. What what other interests like the 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 Middle East the oil I think the U.S. like having a French a good friend there in the Middle East. What are the other interests that we're that we're talking about that might be important to recognize? That, you know, there are domestic there are people who are very powerful, very many, and I have heard I don't know if this is true or not. That somebody threatened Biden, if you don't come out full force for Israel, we're going to make sure you're not reelected. I don't know if that's true, but I know of those kinds of things that do mm -hmm. happen, and it can, it sounds like it could have been. We know, for example, that as Congress people, the first thing they do when they get elected is they make a trip to Israel, and all expenses paid trip to Israel. And they only go to Israel, they never go to the Palestinian side. But in response to that question, I would say we need to encourage our pastors to go. Uh, we have a small little group here, which is now slowly revolving. Uh, it's called Interfaith Community for Palestinian Rights. And we wrote a grant, and we actually received a grant from IPMN, which is the Israel Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church. And we received the grant. And they have lots of great resources there. Israel, Palestine, Internet. You can Google that. And so we got several thousand dollars for our grant, which was called Growing Feet. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to encourage pastors. Uh, the plan was to go and um, talk to all the Presbyterian pastors in Austin to see if they'd like to go on a trip to the Holy Land to the Palestinian side. And unfortunately, COVID came along mm -hmm. and we weren't able to do that. And we actually decided to return the money because we thought it needed to go maybe elsewhere during that crisis. Mm -hmm. But I know from my church, my pastor went to Palestine and she said, I thought I understood the situation. 
But when I went and lived with a Palestinian family, I was blown away and I just saw how it really was. So yes, I would bring response to that question. I would say there are forces working against us and not to be afraid to say this, but you know, you had a trip here at the seminary that went and one of my pastors went on it and he asked to speak to me and I complained to him. I said, then, well, who is arranging the trip? He said, it's an Israeli travel agent. And I said, and who's setting the agenda? He said, well, the synagogue's having a big part in that. And I said, and when are you going to meet with the Palestinian Christians? And the, the response was, well, you know, this is not about that. This is about collaboration and so on and so forth. I mean, I complained because, you know, I'm an old lady. And what the heck? When do we have to see? Who cares, right? And but they did change the agenda, and they went to Bethlehem, and they did meet the Palestinian Christians. So I think it behooves us to speak out and speak up. We're watching you. We're watching you. We want you to be fair. We're not saying you have to believe in this or you have to believe in that. But go and listen to the other side. Hear what the other side has to say. Let them tell you. I don't want to tell you what they have to say. Let them tell you. Yeah. So I have, um, you know, I, I kind of hear the other, other side. Um, and just wondering if you have any thoughts or suggestions when you hear this stuff that you don't miss, you don't really know how to respond to it. So, for example, you know, one of the things that's being said is, well, there's this elaborate network of tunnels um, underneath, and the only way they can get to Hamas is by bombing the whole place because that's the only chance. So, you know, you have to wait on them, you know. So, you hear these kinds of things. Um, if you're having babies, I need to answer from the other. So, that's what I struggle with sometimes. You know, what? I don't know. Any, any suggestions, any resources, any thoughts on? Well, my position is if you are not practicing human rights, you're going to have resistance. I'm not saying Hamas is the right resistance. I'm just saying it's a form of resistance. We saw that the Christians resisted. There's been lots of nonviolent resistance. If you don't fix the problem, this is not the end of it. They can obliterate the tunnels. They can obliterate Hamas. And I can promise you that the next group that comes along is going to be even more violent and more radical than Hamas. And this is, this is what happens, right? Um, so my personal story is that my father was a hostage in Lebanon, and he was taken by a group called it was called Jihad Islamic. And they morphed into a different group. And then they became a different group. They became Hezbollah. And so this is what's constantly happening. Until you fix it, so that people can live normal lives. This is, people don't want to be doing these things. I don't think. I mean, we hear that it's because of Islam. It's not because of Islam. It's not what Islam teaches. They're always radicals on every side. Even Christianity is a radical, right? That we don't agree with. But if you don't take care of people's needs and you dispossess them over and over and over again, you're going to be happy people. They're going to resist. So I would say, look at the root problem. Have you looked at the root problem? How do you feel about the occupation? Are you okay with what's happening with the occupation? Do you know what's happening with the occupation? And then come back to me and say, well, you know, uh, we, we need to do all this. We need to obliterate. We need to, you know, bomb every single building in Gaza to be satisfied. I mean, for me, this is about revenge. How dare you? How dare you? Israel is such a powerful, the fifth most largest military in the world. How dare you, you know? find a way to get around all the technology and come in and massacre our people. How dare you? We're going to teach you a lesson. I may be wrong about this, but that's the feeling I get. Um, and of course they want to rescue the hostages. We all want them to rescue the hostages. We don't want a single person to die. Neither on this side nor on that side. But let's try to get those people to understand how would you feel if you're a Jew? How would you feel if the tables were turned? If you were under occupation, I mean, there's so many similarities to what the Nazis did, right? How would you feel if somebody came in and took your home? How would you feel if somebody shot your child, child in the street? It's happening. I think 100 people have been killed just in October 7th on the West Bank because there's all this rampaging and there's all the soldiers. Okay. How would you feel about that? Are you okay with that? 
if you're not okay with that, well, what are you expecting the Palestinians to do? You want them just to leave so you can take the land? I think most people would, if you can get them to think along those lines um, and not focus so much on Hamas, on Hezbollah, on Jihad Islami, on whatever, right? Even ISIS, there's no ISIS before the Iraq war, right? Didn't have to be wrong. Uh, so, I think the beheaded baby situation. Well, so of course, you know, the, what did they say? The first casualty of war is the truth, right? I mean, there has, I think, Al Jazeera and others have said this is not true, that this was video that was doctored. I, I mean, we haven't heard before this of Hamas, you know, butchering people. I think it's unlikely, but what do I know? I don't, I don't want to say one way or the other. And I think that at least just listening to all the news sources, because um, a lot of people that I know who are big Zionists, you know, I, I don't know a lot, but I, I family that married to a Jewish family did a birthright tour and very, they came back very Zionist and um, they, they, they get their news from a particular space. And whenever I try to have conversations, every time it's don't tell me about because I would say the civilian casualties on this side of this way and so much smaller on this side, and I'm very concerned about the disproportionate amount of power um, that's happening here. And the response was always, "You're getting your numbers from Hamas." And you know, the the, the other thing is just talking about the root problem is what. If you want to talk about Hamas, no one is endorsing anything they do. What do they want any Palestinian to do? What do they want the children to do? What do they want? They just want to say, I'm sorry, there are tunnels. Well, and and I, I'm not always going to buy the issue of the tunnels, the, the argument about tunnels. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they have the technology to get into a phone call, which is what the Israeli government said that they did um, before the hospital was bombed and they bombed a hospital. They said, we, we listen to it. How do they have the technology to do that, but not pinpoint their exact location? And I will say today, there was someone from the State Department on NPR, I could send it listening for a little this morning, and they said, can you confirm that somebody from Hamas, a, a key leader in Hamas, was killed in the refugee camp attack, refugee camp? Um, can you confirm that he was killed and that he was also the mastermind behind um, the a terror attack that happened on the 7th? And he said, you know, I can't really just say, speak to that, but what I can tell you, and I, I was like, let me find this guy. Let me find him right now, because what he did is he dodged the question, and it tells me that they couldn't confirm what has been claimed over and over all over the place. U.S. intelligence, they're not going to have access to Israeli intelligence? Of course they are. So we have to be really shrewd at listening to the way that they do these things. Because if they did kill um, you know, a key leader, why hasn't the US confirmed that? And so I, I'm I'm I don't know. I, I want to say I agree with you. I, I I can't say yes, this happened or no, it didn't. But where is the truth? I, I don't think we can know. We're not, and that's why I think the, the murder of Shireen Abu Akba is such a great example of what can we know is true and it took over a year for the truth to come out about the murder very little you can find the new york times article about it maybe al jazeera yes but our country tried to say that al jazeera was some kind of terrorist organization some legislator tried to say that. so i think um just a lot of discrediting of, of voices and, and so i think at the very least the people that you're speaking to should you should invite them to say, well, why don't you look at all of these sources and like you said, make up your own mind. But no, just get your news from these handful of sources. Look at all these voices and put together, try to put together what you think is really going on. And Gaza, how do you feel about Gaza? It's the largest prison in the world. Everything is controlled by Israel. Everything that goes in, Israel comes out. Are you okay with that? You want to go visit your relative? You can't go unless you get a permit. The food, the water. This is prior to October seventh. Are you okay with that? You, you know, you can't get any medical supplies in. You can't build. You can you can't rebuild. Israel has bombed Gaza multiple times. You can't get materials to rebuild your house. Are you okay with that? 
children under the age of 18, um, and we think about when, uh, you know, Gaza was, uh, was deemed uh, settled in a way, but, but you know, kind of put under the subscription, those kids have grown up in an open-air prison, and, and I think, uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Gabo Ponte had said this, that post-traumatic stress is not a factor with these people because the post has not happened. <laughs> They're still under the PTSD of this. And, and we think about, you know, just, just growing up in, 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 especially as children deprived of not just food, but water, basic essentials, but you're witnessing um, kind of very public, very open brutality. Um, you're also uh, witnessing just the product of whatever your parents and their grandparents have to face. That's kind of the, the, the present, that's the memory that you are coming up with. Um, and, and just thinking about for, as we kind of study uh, in folks who have uh, had traumatic experiences and now we get a wire of certain things happening, what is trauma do to the brain? How does trauma stymie so many of our basic functions and faculties and whatnot? And thinking about what does it do in the present for people who are at that age when you are cognitive uh, elements, so many of your formative uh, parts of you are being developed just in that moment as adolescence question. Uh, so we're just thinking about just how much more the impact is on children or on uh, that generation that then goes up as uh, Dr. Chris has alluded that, you know, you, you, you can't bomb your way to peace, right? You know, that we, we've seen that with uh, U.S. foreign policy. We'll, we'll go and bomb uh, as much as we can, and still the Taliban will come back, and still other things will come back, still all these other things that we deem as negative actors will evolve, will come back in different ways. And um, just, just thinking about uh, not necessarily seeing that as a product, but seeing it as a future derived, right? These are children, hopes that just like you or myself probably just want to do, you know, whatever we'd like to do in the full life, but thinking about what happens when that future is around um, and what, what is left as feeling the only viable outcome. So I want to thank y'all for coming here and for folks online for bearing with us. Uh, I'm talking to our IT person on the, on the phone here. He was just like, I'm supposed to try to read a know what happened. Uh, I appreciate y'all coming with us. I'll definitely be sending out an email with the links and the information not just mentioned here uh, and have been lifted up here, uh, but also that have been brought. Um, so uh, any particular things that you may have missed, or you may have seen, or you have a question about, we'll get more information there. Uh, we'll plug you into local uh, initiatives and spaces as well that are continuing to do different activities, uh, vigils, um, solidarity kind of uh, protests or other informational sessions as well, uh, so that you can stay connected. Uh, so I think the biggest thing that uh, we can ask, uh, you know, from the divine and the creator is give us the, the, the patience and give us that ability to not want to make and to not want to work. Because I think for too long we have, and how many more we displace, how many more children will not go up to see adults, or how many more of our kids who go to funding something that we are not aware of. So the least we can do is not aware to stand on. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our speakers for uh, your, your time. Thank you to the audience. Thank you so much for coming. Those online and those that are here, it warms my heart to know that people are interested in learning about it. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Please take snacks. It's not online here, but uh, people are here. Please take snacks. <laughs> we can get out of there. Um, we really appreciate it.